listening to the DolphinsTalk.com podcast, the most listened to daily Miami Dolphins podcast on the internet. Miami's got Dolphins, the greatest of all Come on, Dolphins fans. Time to fins up. We're in the air, we're on the ground, we're always in control. And when you say Miami, you're talking to our ball. Cause we're the Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins. Good afternoon, Miami Dolphins fans. How are you today? And thank you for listening to the DolphinsTalk.com podcast on this Friday, August the 9th. I am your host, Michael Leva, flying solo today as we got Miami Dolphins football, the first preseason game of the year in a few hours. And I wanted to pop on here and do a quick show because after the show I did Wednesday night with Ian Berger, there's been a lot of debate. There's been a lot of conversation. I got a lot of feedback on that show, but I want to address the offensive line issue here. And, um, do a little bit more of a deep dive into what the point I was making on that show was. But before we get to that, today's show is brought to you by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, the Miami Heat, the Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all of the professional college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? Don't worry. Visit Canesware.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship to you as well as ship internationally as well if you're not in the United States. Canesware.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Canesware.com. Canesware.com. Also, Dolphins Talk Extra. If you haven't subscribed, why haven't you subscribed? You're missing out. We have... Here's the deal, Dolphins Talk Extra, DolphinsTalk.com, the show you're listening to right now, the shows I do with Ian and Tom, Josh, Aaron, Marissa, Jason, and everybody, free. And they're going to stay free. They're always going to be free. Everything's free. The articles are free. The videos are free. The podcasts are free. Dolphins Talk Extra is a little different. We're doing bonus shows. We're doing interactive shows where you, the listener, can come on with myself, with Josh, with Aaron. You can, we'll do shows together. You can tell us what you think. Tell us, um... If you think we're wrong, you can agree with us or disagree with us. You're paying your $3 or $5 a month, whatever tier you sign up to, to come on with us. We'll do watch along Sundays when the games are taking place in the middle of the game, second quarter. Pop on. Tell us. It's third and two. I hope they do this. I hope they do that. How come they're not doing this? That's interactive content that we're put, that we've built up on a Patreon service called Dolphin Stock Extra. We're going to have fantasy football leagues. We're going to have pick them league survivor pools. And the prizes to win – are really freaking cool. I just tweeted out two of the potential prizes on my Twitter feed at Dolphins Talk. These Tyreek Hill action figures, let's call them, never been to open, still in the box wrappings. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So the free content is always going to be free. We ain't ever taking that away from you. But if you got a couple extra bucks and you got some and you want more Miami Dolphins content, more content from us here at dolphinsoft.com. We're going to have some fun here on our Patreon service. There's also a message board. We know on Twitter, look, if you send me a tweet, I might not see it and I might not be able to respond. We have set up a message board for only people who subscribe and pay. And, you know, Josh, myself, Aaron, um, and plus the other people who signed up, you can chat with us there. It's a little easier to get one-on-one FaceTime with us. So check out Dolphins Talk Extra, patreon.com backslash Dolphins Talk. And I got the links up on our social media channels and all that stuff. And if you're not sure where to sign up, email me at dolphinstalk1977 at gmail.com. I'll just email you the link directly. All right, this show. The Dolphins offensive line has been a hot topic here through the first two, two and a half weeks of training camp. We got a preseason game tonight. Obviously, no arms dead. I wouldn't think Austin Jackson's playing. Aaron Brewer probably ain't playing. If he got hurt the other night, it makes no sense. Why risk anything? Um, it's going to be allowed to back up. So, is what it is. Um, I think a few of the guys, I think, excuse me, I think a few of the guys who are, <coughs> excuse me again, competing for a, um, a starting spot might be playing. Though I don't know about Liam Eikenberg. He might. Robert Jones, um, Lester Cotton. I think some of the, uh, first off, I think some of the guys have to play. They don't have enough people to sit everybody. And it's going to be interesting to see how they p- play because they're going to be going up most likely against Atlanta's backups as Atlanta's going to sit a lot of their starters too, especially on 
the defensive line. So if the guys that we have, quote unquote, penciled in to start, struggle against Atlanta's second string, not a good sign. And it would go with what we've read so far in training camp that, that this offensive line just hasn't looked good. A lot of issues snapping, not just with Aaron Brewer, but with Jack Driscoll, Liam Meikenberg, and some others. They've gotten rid of a few guys who couldn't snap the ball. So there's issues there. Liam Meikenberg's been pushed around at times. Robert Jones, again, it's Robert Jones. Okay, run blocking, can't pass block. Lester Cotton, ugh, he's Lester Cotton. Um, so I want to sort of talk, because yeah, that show Wednesday, I know, you know, I love Ian. Ian's like an older brother to me. and But sometimes when, on certain topics, we don't agree. That's okay. Because that is, we always say, two reasonable, smart people can view things differently, not agree, and still be friends. Um, but, you know, I've got a lot of feedback. A lot of people giving him a hard time. A lot of people giving me a hard time. And I know people are split on this topic with the offensive line, especially in August. And before I start, let me just make this perfectly clear. My name is Michael Leva, and the views I'm about to express are not necessarily those of anyone else but me. But they ought to be, and as a matter of fact, they probably are. And I understand both sides of this argument. And I also understand it's the first week of August. And there's no need to panic. And to be clear, for those who listened Wednesday night, I am not panicking. I am not saying the sky is falling. What I am saying, for those of you who might have misunderstood me, was Miami is going to be just like last year. They've got enough talent to win their 9, 10, or 11 games. They're not going to have a bad season. But... Just like last year, the offensive line is going to hold them back, and they'll probably probably just be a wild card team, and they'll probably be out in the first round again. That's why I am, you know, ringing the alarm bells now in August. Like, there's still time to fix this. There's still time to change this because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And let's not do that because when this offensive line was a problem last year. And it's going to be a problem this year. Is it a problem in that you're going to have a horrible season? No. Like I said, 9, 10, 11 wins, hopefully more. But is it going to prevent you from being a good team in the playoffs? Is it going to prevent you from being a good team on the road in the playoffs? Is it going to prevent you from having a successful offense in the cold, wind, rain, and snow if you have to play in those games late in the year or in the playoffs? The answer is yes, 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 yes. So that's my point. It's not panicking. It's not saying the sky is falling. That's a straw man argument. That's not what I was saying Wednesday night, and it's not what I'm saying now. What I'm saying is what Miami is currently doing is just, you know, it's not working with this patchwork offensive line. And there's so much to talk about here. I know for a lot of fans, they just hope everything's going to be fixed. It's only the first week of August. Don't worry. It's just going to fix itself magically. You know, it hasn't fixed itself magically, you know, the past five or six years or seven years, however long this has been going on. Um, but in the next three or four weeks, it's just going to magically fix itself. And I know there's various people on social media. There's various reporters. There's various people on the radio, TV, podcast hosts who are going to tell you, don't worry. Don't worry. There's still time. It's only August. And, you know, and then, you know, like Ian said, who I love, you know, let's wait till week one and see. It's too late by then. Once the season starts, you can't fix this. You're not going to be able – you're going to be picking up guys off the street who didn't even get a shot in training camp. At that point, teams have whittled down their roster to exactly who they want. They ain't trading you nobody. So it's like it's too late. So let's be proactive here as an organization. And I know I'm whistling through the graveyard. I have no power. But that's the point I'm making, and many other people are making too. I know I might not have the popular stance. It doesn't mean it's the wrong stance. Because Miami's offensive line right now in 2024 is not better than it was last year. Last year, yes, they had the number one offense. I get that. But they were 31st in pass block win rate, and they couldn't make it past the first round of the playoffs. So this notion that this group this year that lost Robert Hunt and Connor Williams, two of the best offensive linemen they've had in recent years, and are now going to promote the Lester Cottons of the world, the Robert Jones of the world, or Liam Meikenberg of the world, into starting roles, and those were the guys who were responsible for the 31st rated pass block win rate because Connor missed a lot of games. Hunt missed a lot of games. Those are the guys who played the majority of the We're going to promote them and think this time around we're not going to be bad pass blocking and it's not going to hurt anything. Don't be fooled by what the coaches are saying. When Mike McDaniel stands up at the media, he never says a bad word about anything. Everything's great. Happy. No time frame for this guy. No setbacks. This player's doing great in practice. That's his job. 
and I don't blame him. He's doing his job right. I'm not mad at him for doing his job. But Liam Meikenberg has not, be, has not been good in this training camp so far for over two, two and a half weeks or so. And he's been bad for three years, and he won't get good in three weeks. Okay, let, let's, just, let's just pull the Band-Aid off. Let's keep it a buck. Let's keep it 100, as the kids say. Liam Meikenberg has been bad for three years. He ain't getting good in three weeks. Robert Jones is a marginal NFL player. Decent enough run blocker, can't pass block. Been that way for a few years, not changing in three weeks. Lester Cotton, again, a marginal NFL player. He won't turn into Larry Little in the next three weeks, folks. And Jack Driscoll, the one signing that we, or I guess one of the very cheap signings we had here, um, has been downright bad the first two-plus weeks of training camp. Um, he's not even good enough to be the backup center because he can't snap. The, it's like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? Do we have eyes on winning the AFC East? Do we want to let the Jets pass us in the AFC East? Do we want to finally beat the Bills and take them over and win the division? Like, everyone at camp, whether it's fans, the local reporters, the national people, the national reporters on site, they're all saying the same thing. They're all saying the same thing. Everyone's not wrong. You know, you got your local guys are saying it. You got your national guys like Pete Prisco, who spent a lot of time at the Miami Dolphins camp. He's saying it amongst others from the national side who are there. And I know. They're all saying that the offensive line is going to be an issue. I know, trust me, I know. It's not fun. It's not easy to hear a bad or negative thing about your favorite team. Never is. I don't like saying it. I don't like to hear those things. But we can't put our head in the sand and ignore this stuff. I know many fans cope with, well, it's only insert the day or month and wish it away. Like Tinkerbell is going to come in the at night, sprinkle magic fairy dust on stuff. It's going to make it better. But pretending like this isn't a problem, even in August, isn't going to fix it. Okay? So we've been down this road so many. If this was like a first-time issue, I'd say, you know, let's wait and see. Let's let's see how this plays out. It's not, though. This is going on year one a row where the offensive line is just, we're mixing and matching a training camp. We got guys out there who probably shouldn't be starting. That guy's... In crucial backup rules, we're lucky to be in the NFL. And it's like we've seen this story play out 100 times, and it's like we're going to go down this road again, and there's still time to salvage this and fix it. And I want to address two things that I hear a lot from Dolphins fans, even some people in the media, quite frankly. You know, Number one, we trust Butch Barry. Butch Barry's going to be fine. Never question Butch. He did great last year. It Don't worry. Really. Let's break down last year's offensive line. Tell me what Butch Barry really did last year. This is a serious conversation. Again, not bashing Butch. Butch is fine. Let's just be serious when people say this, though. Teron Armstead was already great before Butch got here. He was great with the Saints. He didn't improve under Butch. He was already at great level. Connor Williams was going in his second year at guard. He was great year one at guard. He didn't improve under Butch. And I know he got hurt. Nobody's fault. But it's not like Connor took some major leap year two. He's same center in year two. He was year one. Adequate snapper, great blocker. He didn't improve under Butch. Robert Hunt missed half the games last year to injury. All right, nobody's fault. But pre-Butch Barry, he was pretty damn good at right guard, too. He didn't really improve much in half the games he played. So Armstead, Connor, and Hunt really were good pre-Butch, and, the, and Butch didn't like raise their level, raise their level of play any. The only player, and yes, the only player who improved under Butch Barry was Austin Jackson who, by the way, may have improved the year prior. We just don't know because he missed the entire season with an injury. He got hurt like week one or two, whatever it was, missed the rest of the season. So we don't know. And two, he was also in a contract year where a lot of money was on the line after Miami didn't pick up his fifth-year option. He was very, very motivated last year. But again, did Butch improve Liam Lester or Robert Jones? Think about it. The answer is no. So this blind faith in Butch Berry is a bit much to take. I'm not knocking the guy. He's a fine offensive line coach. I'm happy he's here. Hell, if the only thing he ever does in his life is he helped fix Austin Jackson, have a job for the next five years. That's great. But, you know, when I hear fans and media types go, I'm not going to worry about the offensive line yet. And Butch Berry's got to work his magic. What magic? He didn't work magic with Armstead Hunt or Connor Williams. He didn't work it with Liam Lester or Robert Jones. He helped, was part of the part of the process of fixing Austin Jackson, most likely. That's it. So it's like if Butch Berry had, once again, was this magical coach, how come we didn't fix Liam Lester or Jones last year? And how come the first two weeks of camp this year aren't going well? Uh, again, not knocking the guy, but, you know, fans just say stuff, and I don't think they even 
They just say it without thinking about it. It's not just fans. Some people in the media have seen say this too. They just say it without putting any thought behind it. It's like, okay, let's look. Again, happy Butch Berry's here. But it's like, and, and yes, I know Miami had the number one offense last year, for those of you saying that. But they had the number one offense last year where the offensive line was ranked 31 in pass block win rate. Goes to show you, A, how good Tua, Tyreek, and Waddle, and Mostert were last year, that they were able to overcome that and still have the number one offense. But B, think about this. Imagine how much better this offense would be if they had an offensive line that could actually pass block. Imagine how good it would be if they had a decent offensive line in front of them. They would have put up more points, put up more yards, probably won more games. Maybe would have been able to, they've been able to overcome special teams there and get a win. Maybe they beat Kansas City in Germany or in the playoffs because the offense would have been so good. But when you just accept that, oh, offensive, we, we're number one offense, so don't worry about the offensive. That's stupid thinking. It's stupid. Again, definition of insanity. All right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's what the Dolphins are doing right now in 2024. And I know you hear me, my voice is going up, and I'm, you know, talking in an animated way. I'm not panicking. I'm not saying the sky is falling. I'm just saying we're going to just have another season like last year, win 9, 10, or 11 games, and just not make a pass first round of the playoffs probably. Um, so that's what this is. And also, here's the other one. I got to kill this other narrative. Oh, my God, this one drives me nuts. That the Miami Dolphins offense doesn't need like a great offensive line. It's based on, you know, timing and scheme. And, you know, you can't have great players at every position. So you can get by with a with a subpar offensive line. Don't spend money there because we're going to get by just based on the, you know, Mike McDaniel's offensive scheme and a timing offense. Look, I, I can't. I hear this stuff. And maybe it's because I'm getting older. I'm almost 50. I'm 47 now. I've been watching football my whole life. If you actually believe that, that it's okay to have a lesser offensive line and you can scheme around it and run some timing offense and you're still going to be a top five team in the NFL and contend for a Super Bowl, good bleeping luck with that. And I don't like swearing on this show, but that's analytics bullshit that people have made a cottage industry off of trying to spin reality to push a false narrative. They think this game is played on a piece of paper like it's a math equation. It's not. At the end of the day, football is a violent, brutal sport. It is about force, strength, and heart. It's about winning in the trenches. And when it's December and January and it's cold, rainy, rainy, snowing, and windy, that timing-based offense can't be schemed to work. You need some badass mofos on your offensive line to push people around and not get pushed around. I understand you cannot have a superstar at every position. I get that. There's a salary cap. It common sense. But the place to go cheap is not your offensive line. Go cheap at linebacker. Go cheap at running back like pretty much every team does. Go cheap at tight end. You can even get cheap at safety and get by with non-superstars in those roles. But on your offensive line, you need at least – three to four dependable, badass guys on your offensive line, whether you're drafting them early in the draft or whether you're paying them as free agents. You need three to four you can count on. You don't need all five because you can hide someone at, like, one of the guard spot or something. You can get by that, but you need three to four. Now, last year, Miami went healthy, had Armstead, Connor, and Hunt. You had your three, and you're hoping for the best with Austin Jackson, and you're hoping for the best at the other guard spot. Not ideal, but then with the injuries, it all fell apart. Um, but you need three to four solid, dependable badasses on your offensive line. Because the fact for Miami is for 80 to 85% of the year, and you're running this Mike McDaniel scheme-based, timing-based offense, yeah, you might be like, well, why am I paying offensive line? For 80 to 85% of the year, I'm not going to maximize their value. Why pay for that position? doesn't make any sense. Yeah, okay, you're probably right. But the other 15 to 20% of the year, January, December, playing in the elements, that's when you really need them. That's when you're paying them for. That's when you need those badass mofos on your offensive line to when you're in the Cleveland in December, like we are this year, at night, and you're trying to block Miles Garrett and you're trying to move the ball, and it's probably going to be windy because they're sitting right on the lake. It's going to be uh, probably rain or snow or sleet, and you got to be tougher than them. And then you got the Jets as well on the road. You can laugh at the Jets pick on the Jets. Good defense. You're going to be outside in that windy stadium in the elements. You need those badass mofos to block them and have your offense work. 
The timing scheme-based offense is great in nice weather in domes. It's great for three quarters of the year, but the most important part of the year, it's not. So they, this is why this is important, and this is why fans like me, podcasters like me, bloggers like me, whatever, reporters like whatever you title you want to give me with my history and resume, which most of you know. Um, you know that that's why we're ringing the alarm bell in early August. Not saying the sky is falling, not panicking, saying you have time to fix this and let's fix it now. So it's not another season of the same old, same old. And I know there's no easy answer for this on August 9th. It should have been addressed in March and April. Can't go back in time. Don't have a DeLorean. Don't have Doc. We're not going back in time. But on August 9th, they got over 30 million in cap space and they got a bunch of draft picks and a few players that can trade. Jeff Wilson they have a log jam at running back. You can trade Jeff Wilson. Smythe, they have a log jam at tight end. You can trade Smythe. If you can package those guys with a pick, pack, you know, package one of those guys with a pick. And if you can get an offensive lineman who can come in here and start and play better than what we got, go for it. I'll be fine at tight end with Jonu Smith, Jody Fortson, Tanner Connor, and who am I missing? There's someone else I'm missing. Whoever the other guy is I'm missing. Um, uh, Hill, I'll be fine at running back. With Mostert, Achan, Wright, and Chris Brooks. You know, there's guys we can move here, package with a pick. Um, we have two comp picks coming next season around three because we lost Wilkins and Hunt. Can't trade those picks now, but knowing that they're coming, here's what we got next year. You got one pick in round one, one pick in round two. You already traded your pick in round three for Jalen Wright, so you're going to have two picks in round three coming. And then you got one pick in round four. You got two picks in round five and three picks in round seven. Okay, we got enough picks here. Obviously, you can't trade the third rounders, but knowing that they're coming, no, I'm not saying trade a first rounder for a backup lineman or even a second rounder, but you got, you know, trade a, if you wanted to trade a second rounder to get a good offensive lineman, go for it. But, you know, package some of these picks round four and later with a Wilson or a Smythe, find a team and make, you know, start making calls. Get off your ass, Chris Greer, and do something. You got Seattle just signed Connor Williams now, and I read an article that. They had so many centers and guys who could play center and guard already that they're probably going to have to cut or trade one or two of them. Now, I'm not saying they're going to be great, but they might be better than what we got. So if Seattle doesn't cut one here soon with Connor now in the mix, say, hey, look, I got a sixth, seventh round pick, or what do you want? Pittsburgh and James Daniels, who once was a high pick by the Bears, played for the Bears, that whole thing. He's, you know, I don't know if he's going to be part of that. Are you trade to San Francisco? Let's not wait. Let's call it. Let's snake him. Let's get in there before San Francisco does, maybe, and offer Pittsburgh something that they can't turn down. Get James Dean. Again, are, are either of these guys pro bowlers that we're trading for? No. Are they better than what we have? Yeah, probably. And those are just two teams that might have a log jam. I'm not going to go through every team and see who's got like a log jam at Garden Center. It's not my job. You got people making seven figures to figure it out. Um, but, you know, do something, uh, figure it out. Because here's the deal. You paid Tua, you paid Tyreek, you paid Waddle. They have a, they have a legit three-year window to make a Super Bowl because you can't move on from Tua for about three more years. Not that you want to, but if things don't work out, you can't move on from for three more years. Tyreek's locked up for about three more years, roughly. Um, they got a three-year window. Let's not blow one of these seasons, you know, trying to think, oh, well, we're going to let – we're going to let Liam Eikenberg, Lester Cotton, and Robert Jones screw up our season. I mean, don't waste prime years of Tua, Tyreek, and Waddle because of that. When we've seen that last year and in previous years, these guys fail time after time. So that was my stance I was making on Wednesday. And again, if you hear me and you hear me talk animated, that's just my style, number one. But if you hear, oh, you're thinking the sky is falling, you're panicking. No, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is, we know how this is going to end. Let's do something to fix it and because everyone's saying the same thing. And it's not too late to fix it. There's still time to do things. Um, and waiting for late August on the waiver wire after final cuts, that's not ideal either because Miami's so far down on that waiver wire list of priority. Other teams are going to put in claims on these guys, and they'll never sniff Miami. So that's all I'm saying. Um, we'll see how they do tonight in the preseason game. Hopefully they all play well. Um, again, with this preseason game, don't care who wins. They could lose 77 to nothing. Don't care. It's about, A, nobody getting hurt, and, B, seeing how some of these young guys uh, play. That's all you take away from these games. The scoreboard means nothing. It's about, can these guys play well? And when Miami starters, or a few of the starters, because a few are going to play, 
probably like, again, Robert Jones, Liam might be out there. I don't know. If they're getting beat badly by Atlanta's backups, well, that's just another issue. Like, I mean, again, how many times do you have to see the same thing, the same result, and not and just sit with your hands on your lap and not do anything? And not just them. We'll see. Um, I don't know how many other stars are going to play, actually. You might, you'll see the rookies. Um, Chop Robinson, I expect to play some. So we'll see him probably. Um, I don't know. We'll see, but – I don't expect most of the important players. Like you're not going to see Tyreek or Tua or Waddle. You won't even see John o. Smith. You won't see most. You probably won't even see Achan. Honestly, they're all going to sit. Austin Jackson's going to sit. Armstead obviously sit. Ramsey sit. Um, like all your important guys, you might even see Agba sit. Yeah, I know he just got here because they just can't afford to lose him either. Um, Zach Sealer's going to sit. Campbell's going to sit. So it's more about watching the rookies and see how they look in live game action. And seeing, you know, which one of these offensive linemen, um, even if they're not penciled in now to play, can any of them just do anything and stand out? Again, dolphinstalk.com. Check it out. We got all the free podcasts up. We got videos, articles, everything you need there. Dolphins Talk Extra, patreon.com backslash dolphins talk. Having a lot of fun on Dolphins Talk Extra. And we're just getting started. We're only four or five days into this. Just wait till we get more people signed up. It's going to be way more fun, and we're going to grow this thing, and it's going to be awesome. And wherever you listen to this podcast, Podbean, Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, Podchaser, iHeartRadio, Audible, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Tom and myself will be on right after the game ends, post-game wrap-up show, Dolphins Talk YouTube channel, live, and then I'll drop it in audio form uh, right when we're done. So check that out. Make sure right when the game ends, uh, we'll have a post-game wrap-up show. We'll be on live. And a shout-out to our friends at the I Am Miami Dolphins fan Facebook page, run by the great Carlos Hernandez at finheaven.com, largest Miami Dolphins message board on the internet. Everyone have a great Friday. We'll talk to you again later tonight after the game. And don't forget, we must put an end to highway profanity.